you'd be very welcome, and you can join us via Zoom if you want to as well. Um, BB meets tomorrow evening, um, and it'll be the Anchor Boys meeting, I believe. Um, so um, they meet on alternative Mondays. Um, so it's, uh, you know, be Anchor Boys one week, and then Junior and Company the next. Um, BB also needs helpers, so if you can help out with that work, just contact Ian. I'm sure he'd love to hear from you uh, about that. Then um, Friday, yeah, is GB, and it's uh, this week. Um, I always have to update this all the time. This week for uh, GB is uh, seniors and brigaders. It was the little ones last week, so <coughs> so it's uh, it's 7:15 in the hall um, for GB this Friday, and uh, again continue to meet on alternate Fridays for the time being. Uh, communicants classes, we're holding communicants classes. If you want to uh, join us, it's starting this afternoon. So, But if you want to talk to me about that, please feel free to do so. I'd love to hear from you. Um, so just to say that. Um, then Kilcomary committee meeting this Thursday, um, 17th February at 8 p.m. So just to let you know about that. Um, Kilcomary committee, set Thursday, 17th of February at 8 p.m. Ignite Youth Fellowship is on again next Sunday, the 20th of February, in Kilkenmurray Church Hall. Um, so it's every fortnight, and everyone of school age will be very welcome. And it, it, you know, we're looking at, we're studying our way through, or not studying our way, but we're, we're using the Discipleship Explored, which is a great wee resource uh, for the um, Ignite. Then Little Acorns meets on Wednesday, 9.45 to 11.15. If you want to have a place still booking based because of the COVID. So if you want a space for that, if you just ask Alison Brown, Sandra McCauley or Beryl Cowan uh, about that, uh, then you know, you, I'm sure they can uh, accommodate you. Kilcomurray anniversary then, 2021 was the 200 year anniversary, but because of COVID restriction, um, we, we haven't been able to have events, so uh, session thought it'd be good maybe to put a commemorative booklet together. So if you want to do that and have some memories or you know recollections or um, maybe even uh, you know documentation or anything like that, you could give to us for that. We we'd love to put together a wee booklet for the church um, and have something you know to commemorate that 200 year anniversary. So. Uh, just let myself or Mervyn know about that. Um, so, if any interesting memories or information, trip to Israel. There is a, a trip to Israel has been organised by the Reverend Mark Neely, and the it's in May. So, I've left more flyers. A couple of people picked them up the last time, so I just put more flyers out about that if you're interested in uh, going to Israel. It's worthwhile doing, uh, just to see the sights and uh, to, to get the feel of what uh, the, the you know Israel is like as a as a place. Uh, a lot of amazing history in it. So that's it. That's all the announcements, unless something I've missed. Um, I want to just uh, read then Psalm 33 and verses 6 to 12. So Psalm 33 and verses 6 to 12 um, fits in, I think, with our theme because it speaks of God's sovereignty. Okay, so um, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, they're all their host. He gathers the waters uh, of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Uh, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Uh, for he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people whom he has chosen as his, in his heritage. And that's us as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are his heritage through our Lord Jesus. And we are blessed because of that. So I want to sing now. We were going to sing, and we're going to sing uh, 161. We've got the Trinitarian hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty.
Let's bow our heads in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise, we worship you as we gather here today in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Uh, you have saved us, you have redeemed us in Christ our Lord. And so we just bless and we praise you and we thank you that we can come here and sing your praises and sing to the, the almighty sovereign God, uh, God in three persons, glorious trinity. Uh, so through the presence of the, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, living and mighty God, uh, we, we worship you indeed, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, Lord God Almighty. And uh, we give glory and honor to you, Lord Jesus. You are the risen Lord and Savior, uh, who is the head of this church, who is the head of your church universal, who is the Redeemer, who is the humble Savior, who took upon yourself our flesh, who went to the death of the cross, but who has risen from the dead in power and glory, who has ascended to the right hand of God the Father, and who reigns over all things. And we acknowledge, living and mighty God, that you are sovereign, that you are the judge of all flesh, that you are uh, as well the Redeemer God um, of all who trust in you. And so we come before you in fear and reverence, living and mighty and holy God, uh, but we also come before you in love and worship as our Savior God. And we just praise you that we have those two wonderful truths side by side, that we revere you as the holy and mighty God who is the judge of all the earth living God, but we also love and worship you as our Savior God who has redeemed us through our humble and glorified Savior Jesus Christ. And so help us, Father, as we gather here now to truly worship you. Take our minds off ourselves and our own silly problems and lives and look to you, the mighty, glorious, and only God, that we may be lifted out of ourselves and lifted above the things of this world and lifted in our hearts and minds to the worship of the living God. So bless us as we do that, Lord. Help us to do that through the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord God, for forgiveness for all of our sinful and foolish ways. We acknowledge, Lord God, that you have um, saved us in Christ and that, that we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, and in our deeds. And we just pray for forgiveness for all of that. We pray that you would be merciful to us for the sake of Christ um, who has died and, and risen for us and that you would sanctify us, Father, by your Holy Spirit. Cleanse and purify us through the outpouring of your Spirit that we may live and walk in the likeness and, and the glory of Christ our Redeemer. Uh, and be with us for the remainder of our worship, we pray. We ask all of these things through the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, God, and King. Amen. So our Bible reading is from Zechariah, and it's Zechariah chapter 9 and verses 1 through to 8. Zechariah chapter 9 and verses 1 through to 8. Here, Ian, you stick a tally on TV? No. I said, here, you put the tally on? I, no, there, there you are. Yeah. <clears throat> That's great. That's it. That's great. Um, so let's hear the word of God. Zechariah chapter 9, verses 1 to 8. The word of the Lord is against the land of Hadrach and will rest upon Damascus. For the eyes of men and all the tribes of Israel are on the Lord, and upon Hamath too, which borders on it, and upon Tyre and Sidon, though they are very skillful. Tyre has built herself a stronghold. She has heaped up silver like dust and gold like dirt of the streets. But the Lord will take away her possessions and destroy her power in the sea, and she will be consumed by fire. Ashkelon will see it in fear. Gaza will writhe in agony. Ekron too, for her hope will wither. Gaza will lose her king and Ashkelon will be deserted. Foreigners will occupy Ashdod and I will cut off the pride of the Philistines. I will take the blood from their mouths, the forbidden food from between their teeth. Those who are left will belong to our God and become leaders, literally a clan in Judah. And Ekron will be like the Jebusites. But I will defend my house against marauding forces. Never again will an oppressor overrun my people, for I, now I am keeping watch. Amen. And may the Lord our God bless to our hearts and minds that reading from Scripture on his holy and inerrant word. Now, kids, good to see some kids there at the back here and here. So, um, got a wee picture just to put up there. Um, you can get that on the screen there. That's it. 
So, um, what is that lady got? What did, yes, yes. Binoculars? Binoculars, binoculars, yeah. So, what, do you, any of you have binoculars? You have binoculars. What do you use your binoculars for? What do you use them for? Watching the birds and maybe the landscape. Yeah, nobody else, any, any, any other binoculars? No. No, well, yes? To see what? See things closer. Yes, yes. We have binoculars at home and um, <coughs> great for watching the, the red kites and all that. <coughs> Excuse me. In the garden and all that kind of stuff. Not that like red kites in the garden, but you know, birds in the garden and, and red kites and all that kind of stuff. So yes, and you can even look at the stars, you know, and, and the you know, with binoculars it's it's interesting to do that as well. Um, another wee picture to put up then. What's that then? Yes? Telescope. It's a telescope. Yeah, telescope. And uh, what do you use a telescope for? Looking at, what, what do you see in the picture there? In the sky? Moon. The moon. Yeah, so you'd look, yeah, you would look at a telescope through a telescope to see the moon and the stars, wouldn't you? So there's a big, big telescope in Armagh. Um, if you go to Armagh Planetarium, they have viewings through that. And you actually, I went one time to see it and was looking at the moon through it. We all had a wee peek through it. Peep, and uh, it was incredible, absolutely incredible. You could see, like you could see the mountains. and the, I mean, It was un unbelievable. Um, so a telescope's a brilliant thing uh, to, to look at the stars and the moon and planets and all that kind of stuff. Um, but those are all, like binoculars and telescopes are all ways that we keep watch over things, right? We, we watch the stars, we watch nature, we watch the landscape. We keep a watch on things and people, we as human beings love to do that, to watch things and to keep an eye on things. Now, anyone know who these TV presenters are and what TV program they present on? Do you know? You got it in one. Very good. Winter watch. And they also have spring watch as well, right? So you've been watching that? Your mummy does, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, Winter Watch is, is a great program. I am, I've only watched a couple of them, but um, yeah, they, they, um, they, you can go online. They have wee webcams they've set up to watch nature, and you can actually, they live stream it. So you can actually go to their website and watch the live stream of their webcams and all that. If you try it, I, you know, I haven't really tried it, but um, you know, so, so they're, they're into watching nature and various animals and just, you know, giving updates and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's, it's all about keeping watch, keeping watch on nature. And the reason why I'm thinking about that, kids, is that we, we're looking at the Bible passage this morning. Never again will an oppressor overrun my people, for now I'm keeping watch. So God is watching over his people. You know, we think we watch things, but God keeps watch over us. And I want you all to trust and believe and know the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And if you do that, you are saved and redeemed, and God, your heavenly Father, keeps watch over you. He watches over you, and he keeps you safe, and you can pray to him and know that he is keeping watch over your life. And that's a wonderful thing. It's an unbelievably wonderful thing to trust in and know the fatherly care of God who watches over you. And I would love you to know that through trusting in Jesus, and all of us here to know that truth uh, as we look to Christ, our Savior, we have our heavenly father who watches us and who watches over us. He's keeping watch. He's keeping watch and he keeps watch over every one of us. And if you trust in, in Christ, you can know that he blesses you and he guides you and he leads you and he'll always do what's good for you. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. For him, uh, hopefully we're all right. To, yes, that's grand. Uh, our God is a great big God.
God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God, and He holds us in His hands. Sing it ourselves then, no? No, no, that's okay. That's, that's fine. Um, that's okay. Okay, grand. Um, so, right, let's spar our heads in prayer. Oh, well, let's the kids go ahead. Yeah. Okay, let's bow our heads in prayer. Let us pray. Living and mighty God, we, we do praise and thank you that we can gather here on this Lord's day just to rejoice in you, to rejoice in Jesus, our Savior, who rose from the dead and uh, made an atonement for our sins. And uh, we thank you, living and only God, that you have uh, sent to us your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus. And we thank you, Lord God, for every good thing that you give to us, for health and strength and friends and family for our homes, for our livelihoods, our jobs, for the food that you put on our tables, uh, for each and every day, Heavenly Father, that you give to us, for the beauty of nature and of creation all around us. There are a multitude of things that we ought to thank you for, and we pray, Lord God, that you would help us to be a grateful and thankful people, thankful for your mercies and blessings to us each and every day. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, that we can know and trust in you through our Savior, the Lord Jesus, and, and that we have the help and fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we thank you that we can rest our trust in you as the sovereign God, who is sovereign over all things, and uh, who ordains all things for your glory, and indeed for our blessing, uh, as, as those who trust in the Lord Jesus. And so we bring our prayers and our petitions before you, uh, living and holy God, um, our Heavenly Father, we, we, we pray that you would bless our congregations of Drumgulland and Kilkenna-Murray at this time as, as we hopefully move forward out of this period of COVID restriction. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we would be a people who first and foremost um, honour you in accordance with the truth of the Bible uh, in our congregational life. We pray, Father, that this would be a, a place in which your name is glorified and honoured. We pray, Heavenly Father, that through the word of God and by the power and ministry of the Holy Spirit that you would build your church and your kingdom in Drumgulland and Kilkenamurray. Uh, we pray that you would enable us, Lord God, in these congregations to look to you, to be blessed for the future, that um, we would be happy and hopeful as we trust in you as our, as our provider God as we look to the future as, as congregations here in Drumgulland and Kilkenamurray. And we pray, Lord God, for those who are sick among us, for those who are known to us who are sick, uh, and those among us, for those in hospital, those who have been in hospital, those who are recovering from operations and procedures, those who are receiving ongoing treatment, uh, those who suffer long-term ill health. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would strengthen them, that you would grant them your comfort and your hope and your help at this time. We pray, Heavenly Father, for the activities of our organizations and our church congregations. We pray for our Sunday schools as they progress and, and get reestablished in the aftermath of COVID and that our children and our young people would, uh, through um, the Sunday schools and, and through indeed all of our church organizations, 
know the truth about Christ, the truth of the gospel, the truth of your word. We pray for the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, uh, for our denomination as our new moderator designate, the Reverend John Kirkpatrick, uh, prepares to take up office in June. Uh, for, uh, we pray for the remaining months in office of David Bruce, Reverend David Bruce, as he prepares to hand over. Pray your blessing, Heavenly Father, upon these men uh, in their roles and uh, upon the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, that, that we would be a denomination who would remain faithful to Christ uh, to the scriptures and to the biblical truth of the reformed faith. We pray for ourselves, Lord God, that each of us would look to trust in and know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, that um, we would walk with Christ each day uh, and, and, and be faithful, you know, in truthfulness, Lord, in faithfulness, in humility, with a true and real desire to honor and serve you. We pray we would be that kind of people. Uh, and so we ask and pray all of these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So we're going to sing again. We're going to sing a paraphrase. We don't often sing a paraphrase. So it's paraphrase 61. Blessed be the everlasting God. I'm sure many of you have had the experience of um, climbing to a high place, to the top of a mountain or a viewpoint, um, and looking at the scenery all around, um, uh, just you know, for miles and miles. I'm sure most, if not all of us, have, have done something like that at some point. <coughs> I was recently at the, the top of Sleeve Donard, some folks, and uh, unfortunately it was cloudy, it was misty, and you couldn't really see very much. Um, but the views of Northern Ireland from the top of the Mourne Mountains are really spectacular, they're wonderful. Um, and of course, like I'm sure many of you have walked or climbed up Sleep Croob, um, you get lovely views, uh, great views from there. Um, the great thing about a, a view from a mountain top or a viewpoint is that you can see things that are very far off that you wouldn't normally see, see obviously, and you can see things that are near. You know, you have this sort of perspective of near and far. Um, on the landscape that you don't normally have at like you know at a sort of ground level as it were and the reason why I begin by saying that is that we've come to this next section of Zechariah uh, chapters 9 to 14 in which Zechariah 
now deals with the broader themes of future events in terms of judgment and transformation and salvation, things that are, in a sense, near and things that are far away. And um, as a prophet, God has given to Zechariah this kind of high point perspective um, on, on human history. Um, and he does that with the prophets in general. Chapters 9 to 14 really represent messages that Zechariah would have preached when he was in the later years of his ministry. Um, and these chapters are different from the previous chapters that we were looking at, chapters 1 to 8, where Zechariah really deals with the, the, the task of rebuilding Jerusalem and its temple. He's, he then, in the last chapters, deals with these broader themes. <coughs> Excuse me. And in verses 1 to 8 of chapter 9, he focuses on judgment. As I'm sure you gathered from the, uh, from the, the, the passage we read. It's, it's a very uh, sort of much a pronouncement of judgment kind of passage. And the passage contains geographical locations and names which are no doubt probably unfamiliar to, to us. Um, to maybe a wee bit of background helps. Um, what is described in these verses could be judgments that have already happened or, of course, judgments that will happen in the future. People debate that. But Zechariah's description of these locations in these verses are actually uh, really tie in with the invasion route that was later followed by Alexander the Great in 333 BC. And so many believe, and people debate it, and I believe that Zechariah is prophesying here with amazing accuracy the conquest of the whole region by Alexander the Great, which took place 150 years after Zechariah's day. So the judgments that are described in these verses are a prophecy of events that would happen shortly, in a sense, you know, 150 years after the day of the prophet. So Zechariah sees events which are going to happen beyond his day, but maybe not far off in historical terms. And he describes these then, and it doesn't come out in the English text, but he describes these as a massa or oracle of God concerning what will happen. And whenever the, the term massa or oracle is used, uh, the prophet is proclaiming a message of divine judgment in, in Scripture. So this is a massa or oracle of judgment. And there are a number of places mentioned here, so it might be helpful to explain those. Verse 1 mentions Hadrach, and then alongside that, Damascus, which was the capital of Syria, which was now under Persian rule by this stage, um, uh, under the rule of the Persian Empire. What then is Hadrach? Uh, some people believe Hadrach refers to a Syrian town close to Damascus. However, another way of looking at Hadrach is that, it, and I would agree with this, that it refers to the Persian Empire in general. Hadrach is the Persian Empire, uh, because Hadrach is made up of two words that mean hard and soft, and um, a, a reference to the fact that the Persian Empire is made up of two peoples, the Medes and the Persians, um, uh, being referred to at times as the Medo-Persian Empire. Uh, and I think that's probably the best explanation. So the Lord, through the prophet Zechariah, is pronouncing judgment against the Medo-Persian Empire, the great superpower of that day. And, of course, Alexander the Great conquered and dismantled the Persian Empire in 332, 333 to BC. The other place names that are mentioned are more straightforward. Tyre and Sidon are both rich, powerful Phoenician trading cities on the Mediterranean coast. And the other cities that are mentioned, Ashkelon, Gaza, Ekron, and Ashdod, were all Philistine cities on the coastal plain. And of course, the Philistines were the great pagan enemies of the Israelites going all the way back to the time of King Saul and King David. So that hopefully, hopefully gives you an idea of the cities and locations that have been spoken of here. And so the Lord, through the prophet Zechariah, pronounces judgment upon these pagan powers and these cities, a judgment which did actually take place at the hands of the Greeks, or more specifically, the Macedonians, at the time of Alexander the Great. And we are taught a number of things that apply to us from this passage. This is not just history. This is God's history. 
Okay, God is God over history and he's the God of history and he wants us to know that. That's why he put it into the Bible. So, um, you know, the fact that God is God over history is a very important thing for us to understand um, and to, to sort of focus on in our, our own lives. That, you know, we look at the world around us, God is God over it all. And he is the one who directs history and historical affairs and the affairs of people. And we are taught a number of things <coughs> through this passage <coughs> that are important. First of all, we are taught God's sovereignty and judgment. Secondly, we are taught about the, the certainty of God's judgment. So we're taught about the sovereignty of God's judgment. And, and secondly, the certainty of God's judgment. Thirdly, we are taught about God's saving grace. And fourthly, we are taught that the Lord is the defender of his people. So first of all, through this pronouncement of judgment, we see the sovereignty of God. The Medo-Persian Empire, which controlled the region at the time of Zechariah, fell or was conquered 150 years after the time of Zechariah. And the cities mentioned here, Tyre, Sidon, the Philistine cities, were overwhelmed and swept away in that conquest which is God's judgment upon these places and these powers. And so what we see firstly from this passage is that God is a sovereign God who is sovereign over all the affairs of history and of nations, over armies and events and outcomes. And I suppose you might say historians look at these events and they ascribe it all to Alexander and the various events and to the, the Greeks and but the Bible through prophecy and through generally acknowledging the sovereignty of God ascribes these events to the Lord who is in control of all things. And so these verses speak to us of the sovereignty of God over history. In verse 1 there's an interesting clause for the eyes of men and all the tribes of Israel are on the Lord. Uh, that's one way of translating it. There's a debate about that because another way of translating it is, as the ESV has it, for the Lord has an eye on mankind and all the tribes of Israel, which is the other way around. Um, and it actually just comes down to a little Hebrew preposition before as a prefix to a word that changes the whole meaning of the sentence depending on how you, you look at it. So which is it? Which is the right one? Um, well, it could could be either but probably the ESV for the Lord has an eye on mankind and all the tribes of Israel is, is, is the right way of looking at it. It's the best translation because the passage is really about God's judgment on humanity so God is, is watching and knows all things. But actually either way of translating it speaks truth to us. God is almighty and sovereign in his dealings with the world and he knows and determines all the events of human history and when he acts in judgment, he is the one to whom people have to pay attention. So what I want to say concerning the judgments that are proclaimed here against these places and cities and against the Persian Empire <coughs> is that we are reminded that God is sovereign over all of creation and all of history. No one in Zechariah's day would have believed that the mighty Persian Empire or these cities would be swept away in judgment. They couldn't have conceived of it. But God, who is in control of history and the future, determined that that's what was going to happen. And the doctrine of God's absolute control and sovereignty is so important, folks. And it's sad that in the modern church it's neglected. And it's sad that in the modern, our modern life, we, as believers in the modern world, we reject God's sovereignty and live as de facto practical atheists. You know, to not acknowledge the sovereignty of God is to be effectively a pagan. God is God and he is who he is and he is absolutely sovereign. And to be a Christian believer in a true faith is to acknowledge that. The Lord is sovereign over everything. Your life, my life, all things, history, the world, everything. And so often we have difficulties and problems in the church and in our own lives because we don't acknowledge God's sovereignty. We don't recognize and acknowledge that it is God who's in control and not us. 
rather we run around playing little God ourselves, you know, like we're little gods ourselves. And it's so dishonoring to the Lord and so sinful. And we fret so much about things and we fret about the future and we look at things around us. But what the Bible teaches us is that God is sovereign and in absolute control over all things. And that should put an end to our fretting and our fears. The scriptures teach us that God is sovereign over all things. And through that, we are encouraged then to fix our eyes on him and him alone. And upon the Lord Jesus, who is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And who reigns over all things. The Lord Jesus, who is the head of this church, who is the head of the church universal, reigns over all of creation and over all of history, and all things are being worked out for us who trust in him for our good and for our blessing. Do we believe that? Do we understand that and do we believe that? And are we applying that truth to our lives? And if not, why not? Secondly, we are taught through these verses about the certainty of judgment. Very often we look at the world and we wonder whether justice will be done and whether the proud and the unrighteous and the godless will ever be brought to account. But God has already determined in his word that all people will be held to account. And we see from this passage that God's judgments are certain. That the proud, the arrogant, the boastful, the godless, those who live in defiance of God, those who hate God's people, those who persecute and provoke godly and upright people, they may think that they're safe. They may think they're invulnerable, but they will be judged. That's a certainty. And we see this particularly in the cities of Tyre and Sidon and their example. Tyre and Sidon were rich, powerful, pagan powers full of, yeah, lots of skill and amazing things that everybody, like historians, would rave about. But they were also full of cunning and arrogance. And Tyre, in particular, it was an island city. They they built it a sort of outcrop off about half a mile off the coast of the Mediterranean. And it had a double wall, 150 feet high all around it. And the city of Tyre in the, in the time of Zechariah thought that it was invincible. It thought it was impregnable. It was seen as such. Zechariah says of Tyre here in verse 3, Tyre has built herself a stronghold. And it was extremely wealthy. They were traders, you know, that traded across the Mediterranean. And... As Zechariah says in verse 3, she has heaped up silver like dust and gold like dirt in the streets. And Tyre and Sidon thought they were invulnerable. They thought, you know, nothing could touch them, that they were the greatest trading civilizations ever. They trusted in their own strength. They trusted in their own skill. They trusted in their wealth. They lived in ease and, and luxury. But as Zechariah says of Tyre in verse 4, but the Lord will take away her possessions and destroy her power on the sea and she will be consumed by fire. And that's exactly what happened to Tyre. Alexander the Great, who wasn't a man to be trifled with and saw no obstacles, he built and his men built a massive causeway out into the sea to create a land bridge to Tyre and they besieged the city and it fell within seven months to the Greeks and was consumed by fire. And Sidon similarly fell. And the Philistine cities mentioned in verses five and six as is mentioned here, writhed in fear, they waited in fear as they saw Tyre and Sidon being overwhelmed by Alexander and his armies. And Zechariah says in verse, as, uh, uh, verse five, these Philistine cities were gripped by anguish and fear as they too awaited their conquest and destruction. That's that's what happened. And one by one, the Philistine cities of Ashkelon, Gaza, Ekron, and Ashdod fell to the Greeks and they were all sold into slavery. It's 
grim, grim history. It's depressing history in a way. It's fascinating to read about, but it's, it's, it's grim. But the point about what we're taught here through this passage is, you see, nothing will stop the judgment of God when it comes. You can't keep God out. When his judgment comes, it comes. And no walls, no bolts, no bars, no wealth, no strength, no skill will stop God's judgment coming. God allows people who live in scorn and hatred of him to think that they are secure. But all the while, they are growing ripe for judgment. And sooner or later, the judgment comes. And Tyre and Sidon, they represent human pride. The tendency of people to trust in themselves, in their own reason, their own wealth, their own strength, their own security in opposition to God. The Bible warns us that God will cast down all human power and authority that stands in opposition to him and he will judge the proud and the mighty of this world. In the book of Revelation, the, destru the destruction of the, the great city of Babylon is very similar to the description here of the, the, the destruction of the city of Tyre, a very similar uh, account in many ways. And in the book of Revelation, Babylon represents the wealth and power of this godless world in its opposition to the Lord. And in its day, the city of Tyre was the embodiment of wealthy, proud, pagan world in its opposition, its sinful opposition to God. And so we need to remember from this, folks, that this world in which we now live, this world in its sinful pride and its opposition to the Lord, is passing away. And God will judge and bring to nothing all of its power and its wealth. And indeed, we also need to remember, therefore, not to be ourselves caught up in that nonsense, putting our trust in those things. You know, some who call themselves Christians put their trust in those things. But God knows what's in a person's heart. If you're not trusting, if you're trusting in wealth and your own skill and your own security, you're not trusting in the Lord. And all of those who put their trust in the, in the wealth and strength and security of this world will be judged by God. Rather, those who <clears throat> know that true life and true salvation put their trust wholly in the Lord, knowing that God has set the day when he will judge all of these things. Their trust is in the Lord and in the Lord alone. And what's true of the world then in general is true, therefore, of us as individuals. There are many people in this world, and some sadly in the church, who trust in themselves and their own strength and their own wealth and their own security, who trust in these things and therefore they live in opposition to God and to his word, and they will be judged. But we, therefore, also need not be perplexed about the injustice of those who in their wealth and worldly strength live in opposition to God and to God's people because they will receive their justice. It will come. Rather, we should humbly pray for their repentance and for their salvation, faithfully preaching and proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Thirdly, we see from this passage the wonderful truth of salvation by grace. See, the text switches in verse 7 from judgment to salvation. The Philistines and their cities, their culture, their identity were wiped out and swept away in judgment, as we are told in verses 5 and 6. But in verse 7, the Lord declares, I will take the blood from their mouths and the forbidden food from between their teeth. And that language speaks of how the Lord will remove from the Philistine people their vile pagan idolatry and sacrifices to false gods. And we are told then amazingly in the second part of verse 7 that those who are left, the remnant of the <clears throat> Philistines left over from this judgment, will belong to our God and become leaders, literally a clan in Judah. 
In other words, the Lord will take away their pagan idolatry after this judgment and incorporate these pagan peoples into his people so that they become worshippers of the true God. Again, we're told Akron will be like the Jebusites. Akron was a great proud Philistine pagan city. The Jebusites were the original inhabitants of Jerusalem before David took the city. And when he took the city, the Jebusites were kind of absorbed into the tribe of Judah. So verse 7 speaks of how pagan Gentiles will become part of God's people and part of God's saving plan. And we don't know if this actually took place in the few hundred years after the time of Zechariah's day. But that picture of pagan idolaters turning to the Lord and being included in God's people was fulfilled through the coming of the Lord Jesus. Christ died so that all Jew and Gentile can know forgiveness through faith in him and have the hope of eternal blessing and salvation and be incorporated into the people of God. And in the days of the apostles then, the gospel was preached to the Gentile peoples who lived around Judea and Samaria, and they were brought into the church in vast numbers. And so it was fulfilled. And we also know that blessing of salvation through faith in the Lord Jesus. So we, we are the fulfillment of this, of the inclusion of Gentile people into God's plan of salvation. Do we realize how fortunate we are to belong to the church? You know, God could have passed over us. Do we understand how precious the church is? What a privilege it is to belong to the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, God has given us this privilege and so we need to rejoice in that truth and we need to treat the church with respect and with humility and to cherish the church as the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ of which we are part because this is a privilege. It's not a right, it's a privilege. And finally then we see in verse 8 that the Lord not only judges the nations and brings salvation alongside judgment through bringing the Gentile peoples in. But he defends and keeps watch over his people. Two promises are brought together in this passage. Firstly, that no godless power or empire of man will ever escape God's judgment. No man-made fortress or security can keep God out. But also, we have the promise that God will protect his own house his own people. But I will defend my own house against marauding forces. Never again will an oppressor overrun my people, for now I am keeping watch. God's own people stand secure forever. Of course, like the Jewish nation suffered other oppressors and themselves became corrupt, and Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. And the church has suffered persecution throughout the ages and has in many ways been infiltrated and corrupted throughout the centuries. But the truth is that the Lord never ceases to establish his people. He never ceases to purify his church and to build his church and to build his kingdom and to renew and to revive. And actually what is said here about the Lord's protection of his people. I will defend my own house against marauding forces did in a sense come true in history because Alexander the Great decided for some unknown reason to leave Jerusalem alone. Unlike the pagan cities that are mentioned here, he did not loot or destroy Jerusalem. See, Alexander was just God's instrument. And he couldn't do any more or less than God permitted him to. It's said by the first century Jewish historian Josephus, it's unverified, it may or may not be true, that when Alexander approached Jerusalem with his armies, the high priest who had sought the Lord in prayer and offered sacrifices for the nation went out in procession with the people and the temple priests to meet Alexander. And that Alexander, much to the annoyance and amazement of his generals, fell down on his face. Little Jerusalem was spared, 
while all those other pagan powers were wiped out. Truth is, folks, that while nations and empires and kingdoms have come and gone, risen and fallen, God's people are still here. Kingdoms and empires have come and gone while the church of the Lord Jesus Christ continues and will continue long after you and I are dead and gone. Because that's God's will and that's his plan. And the church indeed will persist and continue to the end of this age until Christ returns. Christ continues to build his church and his kingdom by his word and by his spirit and nothing will ever prevent that. It's not of man, it is of God. And the question then for each of you is, are you ready for the judgment of God? Are you really ready? I mean really actually ready for it. Are you ready to meet God and give an account to him for your life and what you've done and what you've said and what you've done to other people and whether or not you have truly known Christ. Are you ready? Because it's coming soon. Are you truly trusting, not pitter-patter lip service trusting, are you truly and actually trusting in and knowing Christ as your Lord and Savior? Trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ who shed his blood for you on the cross. God is sovereign. No one escapes. God will judge nations and nothing will prevent his judgments. And no one will escape his judgment. And no pride or strength of man will ever prevent the inevitable judgment and account, the final account. And each one of you, each one of us individually, will make an account before God. Are you ready for that? Have you truly trusted in the Lord Jesus who God sent to be your saviour? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the goodness of your word and the challenge of your word. We thank you, Father, that you are a God of salvation as well as a God of judgment. And Father, I pray that each person here, each person perhaps listening online, would truly trust and know Christ as their Savior and Lord and King. And so I pray for their souls and their salvation. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to sing our final item of praise then, which is 492, Before the Throne of God Above.
now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen.